So yes, welcome to our Wednesday evening meeting. Uh, it's good to uh, see each other again and uh, to share fellowship together this evening. And uh, I'll hand over to Sukesh now, who will uh, lead us through our meeting. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, uh, lovely to see you all. Welcome. And uh, if you are following us later on uh, YouTube or on disc, uh, welcome to you as well. This is our Wednesday prayer meeting Bible study that we normally hold. Uh, I know we're back in lockdown, and I guess that's not the happiest of times, but we are in the presence of God, and we've come that we might hear from his word, and especially that we might pray. So let's come with hearts full of thanksgiving. Let's come and bring our prayers to him today. We're going to begin with prayer. Let's pray together. Our God, our Father, we do thank you again for this opportunity to meet together as a fellowship of your people. Our Father, it is such a lovely thing, a precious thing, when God's people meet. The circumstances are unusual. The method in which we are meeting is unusual. But we thank you, our Father, that we are able to see each other. We are able, to, Lord, to speak to each other. And above all, we thank you, Lord, that we are able to come into your most holy presence, that we might bring our worship, our adoration, and our prayers to you. Our Father, we, we pray that as we come this evening, we would be mindful of this, that we are in the presence of God. And we thank you, our Father, that we are able to come. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who has cleansed us in his own blood, taken away our guilt through his death on the cross, given us his righteousness, made us your beloved children, poured your love into our hearts, and has enabled us to come into your holy presence. And our Father, we pray as we come, we would be mindful that we are in the presence of God who loves us, and the God who is holy and just. So, Lord, help us, we pray, to be mindful of these things as we look at your word and then come to you in prayer. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a hymn, and uh, this reminds us of the mercy of our God, Father of mercies. <laughs> 
Our reading this evening is found in the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 13. The Gospel of Matthew and chapter 13. And uh, we're going to read two passages. We're going to read firstly verses 1 to 9, and then we're going to read uh, 18 to 23. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, and uh, we're going to read, first of all, uh, verses 1 to 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. And great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down. And while the whole crowd stood on the beach, uh, I'm sorry, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And then uh, I'm going to turn to verse 18, and we're going to read 18 to 23. This is the interpretation of the parable. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises, on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of us choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. Thus reads the word of God. About a, a year ago, when we were meeting in our building uh, on uh, Wednesday nights for our Bible study prayer meeting, uh, I had been working my way through Matthew's Gospel. Uh, you may remember that we would do a few weeks of Matthew, and then I would take a break, do something else, and then come back to Matthew. And actually, since I became pastor, uh, I've been doing Matthew's Gospel on and off on Wednesday evenings, and um, I thought I ought to return to that. I personally love Matthew's Gospel. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. And uh, while I was doing it during December, I remember just how lovely this gospel is. So I thought it, it might encourage us and uh, help us in our Christian lives to come back to Matthew's gospel and see Jesus' works and Jesus' teaching. Now, this passage, we actually had finished chapter 12. Uh, that's why I've taken a break. Uh, this passage, chapter 13, has seven parables in it, all about the kingdom of God. You know that when you read the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, 
you read a number of parables. There are about, there are about 40 parables in total that Jesus spoke. And it's very interesting to study these parables. It actually makes a very interesting study to look at the parables and Jesus' use of the parables. Broadly speaking, the parables of Jesus can be divided into four groups, four subject matters. There are parables which describe the nature of the kingdom of God. And Matthew 13 is the passage that has these parables. As I say, there, there are seven parables and the others all begin, the kingdom of heaven is like, the kingdom of heaven is like. So there were these parables that Jesus uh, spoke to describe the nature of the kingdom of God. And then there are parables that teach about salvation and the way of salvation. So for example, uh, you have in Luke's gospel chapter 18, the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. You remember that parable, uh, Jesus says, two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And then he describes the Pharisee's prayer and then he describes the tax collector's prayer, and the tax collector simply says, Lord, have mercy upon me, the sinner. And Jesus then says, I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other. So there are these parables that describe salvation and the way of salvation. And then thirdly, there are parables that teach issues to do with the Christian life. So, for example, there's a parable on prayer, again in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, where Jesus, where it says, then Jesus told them this parable, that men always ought to pray and not to give up, and the parable of the unjust judge, how this woman kept coming back with her case, or the parable of the good Samaritan, uh, and how we are to be merciful to those who are in need. So there are these parables to do with living the Christian life. So you have parables about the kingdom of God, you have parables about salvation, you have parables about the daily Christian life. And then fourthly, there are of course, parables to do with the second coming. And again, Matthew, towards the end of his gospel, has collected these parables to do with the second coming, because Jesus taught them in the last week when he was in Jerusalem. So you have the parable of the sheep and the goats, and you have the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins, and you have the parable uh, of the unjust steward. You know, these parables there at the end of Matthew, all to do with the second coming. And it's a lovely thing when you look at this, and you see the wisdom of God in using everyday matters. A, a farmer goes out to sow seed, or some fishermen go out into the lake and cast a net, or a woman goes to the courtroom seeking justice, uh, or two men go to the temple to pray. Everyday scenario that people would be very, very familiar with. And the Lord Jesus in his genius and in his grace and mercy uh, takes these very, very ordinary situations and uses them beautifully to tell these lovely parables. And they're lovely because they give us such lovely insight into this. How do you teach the kingdom of heaven? How do you teach the way of salvation? Well, you look at that parable in Luke's gospel, the Pharisee and the tax collector, and it's so striking. It's such a dramatic picture because in our default, we would say, the Pharisee was the one who was going to enter heaven. Because when he goes to pray, he says, I thank you, I'm not like other men. I fast twice a week. I give a tithe of all that I possess. And I'm not an extortioner or an adulterer or even like this tax collector. 
And uh, there's an instinct in fallen man that says, yes, this man is a religious man, he's a holy man, he's a devout man, he has good works to commend him, and he's going to enter heaven, surely. And then the other man stands up and he doesn't even lift his eyes to heaven, he looks down, he beats his breast, and he says, Lord, have mercy upon me, the sinner. And again, default setting of humanity, we would say, well, of course, he has no chance. He's admitted that he's a sinner. And then Jesus, the very next sentence, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went home justified rather than the other. And th this is the power of these parables because uh, they use such an, uh, 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 an everyday situation that the Jewish people knew. But then he turns it around and tells uh, the truth, biblical truth, as it is. I've often wondered how people responded uh, to these parables. We don't often hear of their response. Sometimes we do, but often we don't hear of their response. And you wonder when he told these stories, just how did people respond? So Jesus told parables, he taught in parables, and he taught these various subject matters in parables, the kingdom of God, the way of salvation, the daily Christian life, and the second coming of Christ. Well, here in Matthew 13, we have these seven parables all about the kingdom of God. The first parable doesn't specifically say the kingdom of heaven is like, but all the other six do. And because they're all lumped together, we take them as one group and say these are the kingdom parables. And Jesus very graciously, first of all, gives us the parable itself, and then doesn't leave us to guess the meaning of the parable and try and work out what he means. He gives us the explanation of it. He does this in two of these parables. Uh, the first parable, the parable of the sower, and the second parable, the parable of the weeds. He explains both parables. And in a sense, he's just showing us how we are to interpret this parable. So what then do we learn uh, from this parable? I'm not sure I'll be able to cover everything uh, in one study. In one sense, it doesn't matter. We're not in any hurry to try and understand everything. It is a very rich parable. I know it's a very familiar parable. It is a very rich parable, and it has some very, very serious teaching for us. Now, the first thing I want us to notice in this parable is how gracious our Lord Jesus is to a sinful world. How gracious our Lord Jesus is to a sinful world. He begins the parable, a sower went out to sow. Now, in his explanation of this particular parable, he doesn't identify the sower. But the next parable that he tells is the parable of the weeds in uh, verse 24. And he says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed. And when he explains this parable in verse 37, he says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So in that second parable, he identifies himself as the sower. And I see no reason why I shouldn't take that explanation into this one, because there are similarities between the parables. And I take this that when he says a sower went out to sow, he's speaking initially about himself and then about those whom he has commissioned to take his word into the world. This is what it's about, isn't it? This is about taking the gospel into this world. Now, when we look at this parable, we find that not everybody receives his message. In fact, he describes four different types of soil. We'll come back to that. And three of the four different types of soil do not respond positively to the message. Two of them appear to respond, but actually don't. And only the last type of soil actually receives and produces fruit. So the, you have this picture that here is the Lord Jesus himself, and then those whom he 
has sent to preach all of us, his people. Here is Jesus and his people going out into the world with the word of God, but it's a world that doesn't deserve the word of God. In a sense, a world that doesn't want the word of God, doesn't want to respond to the word of God. But this is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is always gracious to a sinful world. And God will always hold out the message of hope, the message of salvation, the message of eternal life to a lost world. You remember what John says in the introduction to his gospel. Uh, he came into his own, but his own did not receive him. And by and large, when you look at Jesus's ministry, there were so many who rejected him. There were those who professed to be his followers. And then when he began to give teaching that they found difficult, they deserted him. You read about this in John's gospel and how the moment he started talking about people eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and it says the people were offended by this teaching and they left him. And the vast majority of the Jewish people did not receive him. There was a small minority who received him. But certainly among the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the priests in the day of Jesus did not receive his message. And yet Jesus brings the message of the kingdom to a lost world, to a world in sin. It's a lovely picture, actually, of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must always remember this, that God loves this sinful world, that God has compassion and mercy upon the lost in this world. And the lost in this world, those who are not saved, in many ways are very, very wicked people. And some of them live terribly wicked lives. And they blaspheme the name of God. And they make jokes about the name of God. There are some television programs we shouldn't watch because they're such blasphemous programs. And they take so much, they, they, they make fun of God and his kingdom and the whole Christian system. They make great fun of it. It's, it's become a matter of laughter for them. And yet God is moved by pity, compassion, love, and mercy for this lost world. We must never forget that. And in love, he sent his son into this world. And his son came with a message of the kingdom. And his son died while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. So that's the first thing I want us to notice in this passage, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ towards a sinful world. I want us to notice in the second place in this parable, the power of God's word, the power of God's word. A sower went out to sow, and, he, uh, and as he sowed, some seeds fell among the path and so on. And of course, the seed is the word of God. It is the gospel message. It is the, the message of God's love and God's offer of forgiveness, salvation by grace to a lost world. And you notice that this sower is not what we might call careful in where he goes. He seems to go out into this field and he just scatters everywhere. He doesn't first say to himself, now I must identify where the good soil is and I'll only send it to the good soil. He throws some on the path and some in the rocky places and some where there are thorns and some where there's good soil. And he just seems to be scattering liberally the seed. It's a lovely picture. I don't know if farmers in Jesus's day did this. I assume they did. I think these parables were drawn from pictures and experiences that were quite familiar. But it is a lovely picture of how the word of God is to go out to every part of the world. And we're not to say to ourselves, oh, but those people are Muslims. 
uh, and they, they have uh, rejected the gospel for centuries and they've persecuted God's servants uh, and they have shown no interest in the Christian faith. Why should we go to them? Why should we even pray for these people who have rejected the gospel? Why should we pray for those in the Western world who are atheists and want nothing to do with the gospel, our next door neighbors, our relatives perhaps, who want nothing to do with the gospel, and have made it clear they want nothing to do with the gospel, show no interest whatsoever in the gospel. And you might think, well, why should we pray? We pray because it is God's will that the whole world should hear his word, and the word of God must go out to the whole world. There are parts of the world which are yet to be reached, and we need to be prayerful about God's work in God's world. And the sower takes this seed because the seed has in it life-giving property. You know what happens in the spring? You're getting your garden ready for late spring and summer. And um, you, you go and you think, well, I think I'll put some new flowers in. Or if you grow vegetables, you think, well, I'm going to grow certain vegetables this year. And you have this little seed. Uh, and when you first look at it, you, you know, come on, it's only a little seed. But it has the, the, the principle of life in it. God has created this seed to have life in it. And you put it in good soil where there's nutrition and water and it germinates and it sends roots into the soil and the roots begin to take in more nutrition and water and bring it up and then it begins to grow and shoots appear and those shoots grow and whatever you've grown flower vegetable fruit whatever appears from that one seed, because in that seed was the principle of life. It had the power of life. It had the ability to produce life and to produce fruit. This is all in the mercies of God. And in the Bible, the seed is used as a picture, as a parable, if you like, of the word of God. Isaiah uses it. In chapter 55, and Isaiah says, or God says in Isaiah, that as the rain and the water fall on the ground and do not return without first making the ground to fructify, to, to, to produce fruit, so he says, shall my word be. So you have this picture of the seed representing the word of God. And it's a, it's a remarkable picture because as, as long as that word has been sown, you can pray. I had a remarkable experience last summer. I had flowers in my garden that I'd never seen before, and I hadn't planted them. Now, I still don't know what exactly happened, but when I spoke to a friend who's a very good gardener, he said to me, your predecessor, the person who lived here, must have planted those flowers and for some reason, neither of us could work out, for the six years that I've lived in this house, those seeds have never produced flowers. But for some reason last summer, I don't know why last summer, but for some reason last summer, I began to see flowers in my garden from seed that had been there at least six years. So you see that seed had been planted and it was just there. And then suddenly in the providences of God, in the mercies of God, it began to produce and these beautiful flowers appeared and I had to learn the names of these flowers. I had never seen them before. And it was lovely, I had a lovely garden in the mercies of God and you, you see the grace of God. It was locked down in the summer and it was lovely to go out into the garden, at least enjoy uh, some of God's creation. What a merciful God we have that at a season like that, uh, he provides something to cheer us. But you see the principle of what I'm trying to say, that seed is sown and the principle of life is there. And in some cases, I'm no expert, but in some cases, quite evidently, after some years, it can begin to produce flowers, fruit, vegetables, whatever. 
And how often have you heard testimony of a person who went to Sunday school, youth work in the church, children's work in the church, and then didn't go to church again? But in the, one, in the, in the mercies of God in that church, there were faithful, God-fearing people who taught the scriptures. In Sunday school, they learned the scriptures. In, in children's club, in youth club, they learned the scriptures. And the seed of God's word was planted in the heart. And sometimes, some years later, God moves that seed to germinate. Because you remember what Paul says to the Corinthians, one man sows, another waters, but God gives the growth. It is God's work. It is the Holy Spirit who causes the word to produce fruit. And so perhaps after some years, they remember something that they'd learned. And God begins to work in their heart and mind. And that seed of the word produces fruit, repentance, and faith in Jesus Christ. And they're saved. There are some tremendous stories of how after many, many decades, I once read a story of a man who was saved more than 70 years after he had heard the gospel. And 70 years later, he remembered that sermon and was converted through that sermon he had heard as a 14-year-old. So you see, the work of God goes on like that. And um, we must always pray. God has been very gracious to us as a church. And we've had children going through Sunday school and children going through children's clubs and youth clubs. And God has raised faithful, faithful people at COPS who have taught the word of God. The word of God has been lodged in their hearts and minds. And the devil hasn't stolen all of it away. A lot of it stayed in the soil. And we must pray that um, God will germinate it and God will make it grow. So just a couple of things this evening. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, bringing the word of God liberally to a lost world. Well, let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for this world that the word of God would go out. Those who have been given the task to take his word would take that word and would be encouraged. And then the power of the word of God and how it produces fruit and brings salvation to lost souls. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the grace of God revealed in your word. And our Father, we do thank you that the Lord Jesus came with the word of God. He came full of truth. We thank you that he has sent us into the world with your truth. And our Father, we pray that you would help us to be those who are living epistles, ambassadors of Christ, living the word of God, speaking the word of God. And how we yearn, Lord, that the word of God may indeed produce the fruit of conversion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We've been speaking about the word of God, and of course the Lord Jesus himself is the word of God, and we're going to sing, You're the word of God the Father. Thank you. 
So we're going to come to a time of prayer. Um, 